Can you imagine your life where money is your friend, working with you to achieve all your dreams and desires? If you struggle seeing money as your friend, then join Kathy Cook Noble, financial advisor and educator on understanding how your money can work for you. It is possible. Now, here is Financially Speaking with Kathy Cook Noble. Good afternoon and welcome to the Inspired Choices Network. Network. You are listening to Financially Speaking, and I'm your host, Kathy Cook Noble. And today we are continuing our journey on financial literacy. This is in Canada, November, and we are, well, it's, it's November everywhere, actually, but in Canada during November, it's Financial Literacy Month. And what we're doing for financial literacy here in Canada is a little bit of government uh information if you will they've got a little bit of a campaign uh it doesn't get as much recognition as it as i think it needs or should and i think most people don't really get to see it and they don't really get to uh take some time and and evaluate it uh, which is unfortunate because i think when we start to talk about financial freedom it really starts with having a lot of financial literacy and if you heard our last couple shows then you would know a little bit about where we are with the level of financial literacy, but the reality of what it is, it's, it's really simply just your understanding of your financial information and having a comprehension of, of what you have and what you need and how to go about getting it. And that's what we do here at the Inspired Choices Network in general, but specifically here on the uh, Financially Speaking show. We talk about money, absolutely, because I believe it always comes back to money. Uh, we need it to buy groceries. We need it to clothe our children. We need it to drive them to school. We need them. Uh, we need money for a lot of various things, but how much we need, that's always the question that we can debate because everybody's needs are different. Everybody's wants are different. Everybody has a different idea of how their life should be, how their family should be. And, and everything that you're thinking about yourself and your family is correct. Because whatever it is that you need and whatever it is that you like, then that's the right answer. And it's that simple. So when I talk in my, my day job as a financial advisor and in our bookkeeping practice, when we talk to individuals and businesses and families and couples uh, about what they want, it's really that's where the conversation should start. Where is it that you are right now in your life and where is it you want to be in your life? And the difference, if it's, if it's a big gap, how do we get you from A to B? And if it's not a big gap, then how do we keep you on course? It's, it breaks down really, really, really that simple. And we sometimes get ourselves all tied up in knots and confusion because the financial industry might be a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. There's a lot more math than most people are comfortable with. There's a lot more graphs and algorithms and and language, I mean, and they've really got their own language, yeah, a lot of acronyms, but uh, like a lot of professions, uh, the financial one has uh, its own real way of doing things and talking to each other that they, uh, if you're in the industry, you talk to other people in the industry in a different way. And that's the part that I think the communication breaks down because uh, if you're in the industry and you're talking to people who are not in the industry, they are not necessarily speaking your language and that's what gets confusing. Confusing. So what we do here is I hope that's our plan and we aim every week to break it down, make it simple so that you can understand it. So today, uh, last week we talked about some American uh, financial literacy and tonight I'm gonna to take it back to the Canadian side because there's some, it is financial literacy month here in Canada. And I last week I was mentioning that it's in April that it was declared in the US but they apply everywhere. So everything that we talk about here is, is applicable throughout the world because the concepts, the strategies, the ideas, the questions, they're all the same. There's a various level of comprehension and understanding and confusion and stress and desire to understand their stuff. And that's all through the world. It's not just a Canadian thing. It's not just an American thing. It's not just an Australian thing. It's a, it's a person thing. And all we really need to do is understand our own stuff. 
And I've said that so many times, and I will say it so many more times, that it does not matter what your neighbors, your cousins, your brothers, your uncles, aunts, it doesn't matter what they're doing. What matters is what you are doing and what makes you happy and what works for your family. So don't stress yourself out because your neighbor bought a boat. If you're not a boat person, who cares? <laughs> if the other neighbor or your cousin bought a trailer and you're not a camper and you don't like to camp, who cares? It doesn't matter. If somebody bought a fancy sports car and you think it's really cool and that's something you want, then that's where you should look and say, if it's something I want seriously, how do I work it into my, my plan? If it's something I just think is cool and I don't really want one, then it doesn't matter. You can just look, admire it from a distance. And, and uh, it, it's not something that you should be jealous of. It's not something you should be measuring yourself against because the benchmark of success is not what your neighbor and your cousin and your uncle and all those people. It's not what you think they have. It's what you have. And success is measured. Financial success, uh, success in general is measured by what you set the benchmark to be. So if, if for you, money is your benchmark and you think that being successful means you have multiple millions of dollars in the bank <clears throat> or multiple millions of dollars invested, <clears throat> excuse me, because I don't think uh, you'll ever, I, I'm not going to ever recommend you put it in the bank because it doesn't, uh, a bank account is not going to make you rich and preserve your wealth because you're going to lose it based on inflation, uh, the power of the money, but uh, that's a whole other conversation. But the reality is if, if it's having a multiples of millions of dollars is your measure of success, wherever it is, then that's what you need to focus on. If that's not your measure of success, and it's not everybody's, it really isn't because the truth is a lot of people um, aren't about the money and they, I mean, they they want money to be comfortable. They want money to be able to do what they want to do when they want to do it. But it doesn't mean that at the end of the day, they died with millions of dollars and are able to leave it to kids and, and family members and uh, just generally have their name in lights. That's not their goal. And that measure of success for them is also correct. So that's important when we're thinking of what is important to us, we have to remember um, what is it that we're looking for for us and what is it we're looking for for our family. So that's what we do here on the Inspired Choices Network. And generally uh, what the part I take on is the financial part. So if you see that you need to plug yourself into a missing piece of the puzzle because it's possible we're missing an expert in a particular topic or a subject area, then I would highly recommend you reach out and talk to Christine McIver. She is our network owner host of the Inspired Choices Network show and gives a lot of business advice and, and frankly, personal advice on uh, how to be happy and that one with yourself. Uh, and there's several, several shows that I would say if you are missing or feeling like there's something not quite right in your life and you need a little support, then there is a show and there's a host here that would be happy and willing and able to help you by just reaching out, asking the questions, uh, join in the chat room, ask, uh, ask them specifically about a topic that you'd like them to do. That I get that all the time. And frankly, that's how most of the, the shows come. And I, I wanna give the conversation to you to say, hey, if this is what you're looking for, then why don't we talk about that? Because that matters. And whatever it is that matters to you, you know, there's other people out there that are asking and thinking the same question. So join us uh, every week. And again, when we're into podcasts, we're over 50 podcasts throughout the world that you can hear the replays on. And you can actually now see us because there is the video component. And you can also uh, download those on our Inspired Choices Networks to watch again and again. And if you miss something or you want to try listening to someone else's show, you, but you weren't able to make the, the live time, then just flip over to the website on our network and you're able to watch it there, which is also very convenient. And in this world of technology, we make it very easy so that you can make your life a lot easier and, and a lot healthier and happier. So we've been talking about financial literacy. And tonight, we're going to continue that conversation about financial literacy. And, and I get asked about um, really what your rights are, your rights and your responsibilities for financial 
uh, any financial issue, quite frankly, because uh, you get different conflicting information out there, but there's actually some legal rights and there's actually some uh, responsibilities for you, some legal responsibilities, believe it or not. And I'm going to actually take some of this right from our Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. And this is where it comes down to. And it's appropriate, I think, because it's Financial Literacy Month here, that we should talk not just about what financial literacy is and how we, you know, last week we talked about how to have some tips and uh, tricks to make our literacy better in finance. And tonight we'll talk about some of the legal parts of it, because not often do people think about their legal parts the way that I think we should. And by that, I mean, every time you enter into any kind of financial uh, relationship, whether it is through buying a house, whether it is through buying a car, if it's getting a credit card, if you're at one of the stores and they offer you in-store credit, uh, if they're if you're at one of the stores and they say, hey, if you sign up for our credit card, this you can get a discount uh, on your purchase today. All those come with some rights and responsibilities that you have as a consumer and that they have as the store or the lending institution, because that's essentially what they become as a lending institution. So everyone has rights and responsibilities. Now in Canada, there's actually quite a bit of consumer protection legislation. So for example, if you were to go and buy a car in Ontario and you went to a registered dealer and a registered dealer is somebody who is registered with OMVIC, the Ontario Motor Vehicle Industry Council, then you have some protection. Now, if you go and buy from your neighbor or some guy down the street that's standing at the corner beside a car with a for sale sign or in anything that looks a little bit shady, that, that's not a registered dealer. You have finance, you still have some legal rights. It's just not as easy and you don't get the consumer protection. But if you go to a registered dealer, and as a side, I would say I highly recommend that's how you buy your car because of these protections. Um, you, so you go into a registered dealer in Ontario, they're obligated by law to disclose certain things to you about the vehicle, about the financing. They're obligated to disclose the price in a certain way that is not confusing. There's no hidden fees. It's got to be uh, all in pricing unless it's the only thing that you can add in if it's not included is the tax. Um, other than that, it has to be very straightforward and very easy to understand, very above board. You have a contract that you write with them, whether it's a long one or not, it doesn't matter. And all these things automatically are included with your rights. And their obligation to disclose this, you may not know all the things that they're obligated to disclose. And there's 22 different points in the act that show for advertising alone. You don't need to know those. And you may, I bet you don't know them, most people don't. And the reason you don't is because you only buy a car once in a while. It's not every day. Dealers are in, automotive dealers are working with cars every single day. That is their area of expertise. They, they know their rights. They know their uh, responsibilities. They know their obligations. They know they have to follow the rules or else there are consequences if they don't. And there's a problem with a, with a consumer. So there's a lot of consumer protection here. So if you buy a car in Ontario from a registered dealer and you enter into a financial relationship with them, because that's what you're doing, you're, if you're buying a car, you're exchanging money for a product or you're exchanging money for a product over time because you're having financing, then they are required to disclose things. And if they don't, then you can go to the OMBIC board of trustees and the consumer protection fund, which means you have financial consumer protection, not just legal protection where they say, yeah, hey, you're right, good for you. That's not helpful necessarily. Some people just need to know they're right, which is great. But I'm talking from a money point of view, if, um, if you are wronged by an automotive dealer in Ontario where they don't disclose something, you have consumer protection legislation. You also have consumer protection legislation on a lot of other financial obligations. Houses are a huge one. If uh, That's usually your biggest asset, right? That's the biggest thing you ever buy. So we're gonna talk today about some of these other big financial obligations. An automotive 
uh, purchase is typically the second biggest op, uh, obligation, maybe the third, depending on if you have, uh, if you get into buying a boat or anything like that. But normally the average person, it would be a vehicle and a house or your two big, big purchases in your life. And it's nice to know. And if you didn't, you know, now that there is some protection for you, some consumer protection here in Canada. Um, we are going to take our first break of the night. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about um, something that we all know really well, but we might not know it quite as the death pledge. And we've, I bet most of us have taken it. And if we haven't, we probably are in the process of taking it. So when we come back, I'm going to talk to you about what this death pledge is that we've taken. Don't go anywhere. You are listening to Financially Speaking on the Inspired Choices Network. And I'm your host, Kathy Cook-Noble, and I'll be right back. Too many of us get caught up in the unreal lives of reality television and complete to acquire stuff, which is setting us up to accumulate lots of debt. We're scared, confused, and don't know who to talk to. By tuning into Financially Speaking Radio Show with financial advisor and educator Kathy Cook Noble, you'll learn tips you can use to improve your financial health, which in turn can improve your overall health and make for a very happy life. Live a life you can afford and enjoy. It is possible. Listen for Financially Speaking Radio Show every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Mountain, and 1 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. This is the Financially Speaking Show with financial advisor and educator Kathy Cook Noble. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email by sending to Kathy at bookkeepplus.ca. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to Financially Speaking on the Inspired Choices Network. And I'm your host, Kathy Cook Noble. And we are just continuing our conversation and our journey on financial literacy to make ourselves more understanding of our own stuff and a little bit, a little bit more knowledgeable about where we're at and what we need to know. So before we went to break, I mentioned to you that we've all taken this weird thing called a death pledge. And if you've ever heard of that term before, it kind of you, you have actually, you have heard of it. You've heard it in a different way, but it, um, you've done it probably more than once. You probably didn't know that's what it was called and you probably didn't understand a hundred percent of it, but you, I can guarantee you when you did it, you invested a lot of money and committed a lot of money to it. And death pledge, just so you know, is also known as a mortgage. That is the Latin translation, mort meaning dead, engage is pledge. So you are literally taking a death pledge when you take a mortgage. Isn't that weird? Isn't that, makes you think a little bit about mortgages differently after you hear that, don't you think? But we typically need a mortgage to get a house, to buy a property, to buy a cottage, to buy a vacation home, whatever the case is. Usually you do it by the use of a mortgage. So what is this mortgage or death pledge that I'm talking to you about? Well, the way it works is uh, you go in and you talk to a real estate person. Let's say you start there. You're going to go buy a house and you see a house that you want to buy and you go through it and the real estate agent tells you all of the bells and whistles and things about it that you like or you, you might not like or anything else they have to disclose to you. 
and they share with you how much it's going to cost every year in taxes, how much it, the utilities were for the, the current owner, and you decide you're going to buy it. And you go to various people and you say, I'm going to buy this house. How much money can you give me for a mortgage? And they ask you different questions. And we talked last week about your credit rating and they pull your credit rating and they say that, oh, you're above the level of whatever they say. It's maybe 650 was the rule of thumb for beacon score um, for a mortgage. So say they, they look at it and which is the beacon score in Canada is similar to the FICO score in the US. So you all get rated and, and they look and they say, hey, you have the right number. Your beacon score is the right number. You need to have X amount of money down on this house and you have that in cash. And then the rest of the money, you're going to borrow it in terms of a mortgage. And you're gonna do one of two things. You're gonna set it up as what most of us know as a traditional mortgage where you pay a certain amount every month and some of that goes to principal and some of that goes to interest. And over a certain period of time, usually it's 20 to 25 years, the house is paid off. That's the amortization period <clears throat> that we're spreading it out. So what happens at the end of that time period, assuming you never move and you never change your mortgage and everything stays exactly the way it is, which doesn't always happen, um, but let's pretend it does. Then at the end of that term, you owe nothing. The house is free and clear. It's hundred percent yours. You have no financial commitment to anybody on that house. Um, now, what does, does that normally happen that way? Not usually. Uh, a lot of the time, especially if it's the first house, people end up moving. And what happens is that mortgage gets paid out. And then we go into another house, which usually is more money. And we get a little bit more money for that. And the cycle just carries on and we re- um, start our new payments or what could happen is people get into some financial trouble and they go in and they refinance and they need to add the debt into the house or what could happen in like what's happening in interest rate climates that we have right now is people's value of their property has gone way up so they go in and they refinance to take out equity in the house which is the amount of money that has no money owing on more money owing against it so if you have a three hundred thousand dollar house and you have a $100,000 mortgage, then you have $200,000 in equity. That's the part you own. The $100,000 is the part the lender owns. So in that sense, people go in and, and they refinance and they get more available cash for them to have in their pocket against the value of their house. So what does this mean for us? Well, this means you're making a financial obligation. So you do have some rights and you do have some responsibilities. So if you're like most millions of Canadians and Americans that have mortgages, you could spend that 20 or 25 years paying off your house, sometimes 30. Uh, and a lot of people see that home ownership is how they can accumulate wealth. And the way they look at that is if you buy a house today, let's say you buy a house today for $300,000, 25 years from now, that house should be worth more money. Now, it should be because you're going to maintain it, you're going to keep it up, you're not going to let the roof rot out, you're not going to let the, the walls rot and not, you know, if the roof leaks, you're not going to fix it. Like, we're assuming that you're going to just keep normal wear and tear and maintenance on your house. So it should be worth more. And it, and the reason I say it should be, if and it's based on those criteria of you looking after the house, but think about 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Think about 20 years, think about 10 years ago, if you can't go back 20 years, how much was a house worth 10 years ago, 20 years ago? They're almost all worth more. The average house is worth more than what it was 10 or 20 years ago. The average house is worth more than it was a few years ago, three to four years ago, because of the way the market has gone and interest rates have gotten so low. So this is a way you accumulate wealth because if in 25 years you sell your house, your $300,000 house is now worth $600,000, you've made $300,000 and you have no mortgage, which means when you sell it, you have $600,000 in cash and you might move into an apartment, you might downgrade to a smaller house. So you end up with more cash in your pocket. That's typically how people think of it. So if you're offered a mortgage by a financial institution, it's really important you understand what their right you're they're obligated to do and what you are responsible to do. So your responsible your responsibility is to get a copy of your financing terms. 
you also have a responsibility to provide certain pieces of information to the lender. And by that, I mean ID, financial information. Uh, uh, they have a responsibility to pull the credit check on you themselves and you have to give authority and authorization because you can't in Canada do a credit check without written authorization from someone. So you can't just go around pulling credit information on people just randomly. Uh, and you wouldn't want to because you wouldn't want somebody doing that for you anyway, because that can affect your credit score. More inquiries equals a lower rating. So what we can do is we can say, we're gonna give you all the information and in return, you're going to be responsible to give me the best advice, best information, best rates available for me with the mortgage. And what does that mean? That means we're going to look at different options. So mortgages are not a one size fits all. People think they go in, they get a mortgage, they pay X amount of dollars every month. And that's the way it makes it sound. But the reality is if a traditional mortgage is you can have open rates, you can have variable rates, you can have fixed rates, you can have a hybrid combination of a traditional mortgage and something called a home equity line of credit, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. And you have the ability to really, believe it or not, as uh, unsexy as mortgages sound, you actually have flexibility there. So you have some ability to do something that is going to work out really well for you and your family. So if you're going to go to a lender and they aren't going to talk to you about these options, and if you don't, there's a lot of lenders you go to, and if you don't specifically ask about a home equity line of credit, they won't offer it. Or if you don't talk to them about doing a hybrid, or if you don't talk to them about how you want to use your mortgage down the road to help uh, finance your kid's education or buy a property as a vacation home or whatever the case is, then they might not be the right lender for you, frankly. But I'm just going to talk to you about what they are rather than how to find the lender. So the, the, um, the traditional mortgage is exactly what I said. You go in, you pay a certain amount. If the rate's closed for five years and it's fixed, that means for five years, nothing's going to change. It doesn't matter what the feds do. It doesn't matter what the interest rates do. It doesn't matter who's in power. It doesn't matter who gets elected. It doesn't matter who's not elected. None of that matters. What matters is for five years, you're paying the same amount of money, period. That's it. At the end of the five years, you're going to look at whatever the rates are at that period of time. And they're going to say, okay, now we can do either you're either going to pay more or you're going to pay less depending on how the rates have gone then. And then you have the option at that point to say, am I going to stay locked in at a fixed rate? Am I going to be variable? Which means variable rates are just that they move up and down based on whatever the interest rates are at the time. So this year, your interest rate could be 1.9%. And next year, your interest rate could be 2.4%. And the year after it could be 2%. They don't move around quite like that, but uh, it's possible. So that's the difference with variable. They can be, uh, the rate moves around because it's not fixed. It's not a, a locked in, same old, same old. And there's different advantages and different adva disadvantages to both. And these are all conversations you're going to have with your lender about what works for you. And if they don't have those conversations with you, then they might not be the right lender. And there are lots of people out there that are really good at understanding these products and really good at helping people. So make sure you're comfortable with the one you've got. So the home equity line of credit is kind of cool. And if you haven't heard about it, a HELOC is uh, another name for it. Um, a home line is sometimes uh, how it's referred to, but it's basically a line of credit. It's a line of credit, which means if you have a personal line of credit, and it's $25,000, let's say, for example. That means you have access to $25,000. And if you use that $25,000, you have to pay interest on it. It's that simple. If you use it, you pay the interest on the money you borrowed. No big deal, right? Easy to do, you have a personal line of credit. Kids, uh, I know a lot of students for post-secondary, they go and get a student line of credit. Same thing, it's a line of credit. They get $25,000, $30,000 for their education, and then they keep paying it back as they get money in, but they make sure they pay the interest month every interest every month. So same idea as the home equity line of credit. You have a responsibility legally to pay the interest every month. You have the opportunity to pay more than just the interest. You can pay the interest plus some principal. On a traditional mortgage, you have a responsibility to pay both 
the interest and the principal every month. That's what you're required to do. There's not the flexibility. So when we um, talk about home equity line of credits or HELOCs, which I will share a little bit more with you after our second break, because we're just coming up to our second break of the night. And I think it's important a lot. I do get a lot of questions actually about mortgages and how they work and the difference between them and uh, what is better for them. And I cannot tell you as I'm sitting here saying the difference is and everybody should do X because everybody is different. It comes the same, comes down to the same thing as I always tell you, your situation is different from other people's. And that includes what kind of mortgage you should have or what kind of financing you should have for your house. So when we go through the home equity line of credit, and I talked to you a little bit more about that, keep in mind, this might be a great idea for you. This might also not be for you at all. And I'll give you my take on uh, some of the people I think it works well for and some of the people I would be very, very nervous to talk to them about or recommend it to. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to Financially Speaking on the Inspired Choices Network. And we're going to take our second break of the night and we'll be right back. Too many of us get caught up in the unreal lives of reality television and complete to acquire stuff, which is setting us up to accumulate lots of debt. We're scared, confused, and don't know who to talk to. By tuning into Financially Speaking Radio Show with financial advisor and educator Kathy Cook Noble, you'll learn tips you can use to improve your financial health, which in turn can improve your overall health and make for a very happy life. Live a life you can afford and enjoy. It is possible. Listen for Financially Speaking Radio Show every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Mountain, and 1 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Money is complicated, right? Actually, no, it's not. You don't have to be a trader on Wall Street to get a handle on your money. TV shows often instill fear to keep you believing you can't understand it or do anything yourself. If dealing with your finances brings up a lot of other F words, then you need to read All Ladies Should Use the F Word, A Guide to Loving Your Finances by Kathy Cook Noble. Kathy helps you take control of your finances and leave the other F word, fear, in the dust. This is the Financially Speaking Show with financial advisor and educator, Kathy Cook Noble. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at inspirechoicesnetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email by sending to kathy at bookkeepplus.ca. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to Financially Speaking on the Inspired Choices Network, and I'm your host, Kathy Cook-Noble. We have been uh, exploring our financial literacy this month, and tonight is no exception. We are actually diving more into specific topics of mortgages and our rights and responsibilities in finance. And we all have them. So we were just start talking before the break about home equity line of credit or also known as HELOC, also known as uh, lines of credit, also known as home lines, also known as home equity lines, also known as a whole bunch of other things, depending on which lender you are talking to, they all have their own term. But the concept is, and the product is exactly the same. So they can call it whatever they want, but this is what it is. It's a line of credit against your house. So if you have a house that's worth $300,000 and you go and you get a home equity line of credit and they say to you the same way they do on any other mortgage, you qualify for 80% of the value, then they will give you $240,000 as a line of credit and you will put $60,000 down in cash and you will own the house. It is that simple. Or they will tell you that you get 80% value and they will give you a $240,000 traditional loan or mortgage, which is more often where they start. And you will still put $60,000 down on your new house. So almost always 
And I say that because I don't, it's hard for me to tell you absolutely that this always happens because I've not seen every single mortgage deal ever to take place, but I can tell you from everyone that I've ever been involved with, either with clients, myself, friends, family, helping them, whatever the case is, I have never seen anybody in the lending institutions start with offering different alternatives to a traditional mortgage. Now, my side note to that, why that is, is because they make more money on the interest. It's locked in and you have a longer term with less opportunity to pay it off sooner. So that's my opinion on it, but I can tell you from experience, I have not seen anybody start with anything other than a traditional mortgage. Now, when we talk about a home equity line of credit, here's the big difference. Uh, a home equity line of credit is like any other line of credit. It goes up, it goes down. You can borrow, you can borrow money anytime you want if there's room on it. You can pay down more money anytime you want if you have extra money. It has the flexibility to do that, which is a bonus. It's also a huge risk. Some people, if you are one of these people that are really not great with self-control when it comes to money. You might be great if you know exactly how much you have to spend, but if you have this flexibility and this opportunity to spend more money, then you might not be a great candidate for a HELOC because if you see extra money and you like to spend money, then that's how you keep the line of credit going up rather than going down. A traditional mortgage can only go down because every day, every month, it's the same, same formula. You pay X amount every month or bi-weekly or weekly, however you've got it set up. And after so many years, it's paid off. And that's how a traditional mortgage works. It goes down, not go, it doesn't go up. A home equity line of credit goes both ways. And that's where people can get into trouble financially. So you have to be very careful and you have to know yourself well enough to say, I don't have that financial uh, confidence and I don't have the financial willpower to not spend money when I see it. And it's a lot easier to spend it. And it's a lot easier to say, geez, you know, I wouldn't normally spend that kind of money on uh, new shoes or new clothes or, or buying a gadget for the house that I wouldn't normally, you know, be thinking about, but I do have this money and it's easy to do. And, and it's just easy when you're not trying to find the money out of pocket. So that's one of the very uh, real risks of people with a, a line of credit option. Um, the other uh, option for it, which is kind of nice, is um, you do have the flexibility. So if there is ever, for whatever reason, you have no emergency fund, you haven't been saving, you maybe you just got started saving, you don't have enough money, and something happens like a pandemic, then you do have access to cash to pay for your hydro bill, to pay for groceries. Uh, so there, So if you have the discipline and you can handle a line of credit on your house, then you do have opportunity for that money to be available in case of emergency. And the only thing that you have to be really careful is uh, you don't wanna think of your house like an ATM where you can just go and borrow against that line and, and then maybe pay some off and then you just end up getting higher and higher. You don't wanna be in that position. Now, having said that, this is your responsibility. This is part on our side to for us to know what works for us, but it's their responsibility to tell us uh, the different products that are available. And it's their responsibility to tell us the good and the bad and the ugly so we can make a good decision on it. Um, now, the other challenge that I would say with the line of credit is you run the risk that if anything ever happens, if you got... Uh, if you lost your job, if you got sick or hurt and you couldn't work, if you had to take time off to look after a family member, then yeah, sure, you've got this flexibility, but now you're also subject to interest rates because you have to pay the interest. And if the interest rates go up, your interest is tied to the prime lending rate. So that means your rate for your line of credit is going to be a little, is a little bit higher. And it also means that you could potentially be in a position where you now owe more money than you did before, which means your debt ratio for lending, if you go to buy any more, um, anything else or go for any more financing, then you're gonna show a higher debt ratio rather than just your traditional mortgage. So these are all things that you have to keep in mind when we're deciding between what mortgage is best for us. 
So you want to, you know, I always hesitate using the word budget because people always kind of cringe and they don't like it. And it sounds like there, there's no flexibility. And it's no fun. But when you're watching your cash, which is all you're doing, that's a budget. You're just tracking your money. And when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you include this, treat it like it's a mortgage that's traditional where you have to pay down so much. And you'll find a couple of things. One, it sets you up on a disciplined uh, cash management plan. But two, you'll also find that you pay off your line of credit a lot faster than you would a mortgage because you're paying less interest overall. So if we decide, say your mortgage is $1,000 a month, in a traditional mortgage, the, the heavy, heavy interest is in the first half of the term and you're not paying a lot of principal. And then you start paying more principal at the back half of the term. In a home equity line of credit, you're paying your, your interest plus additional um, principal because the interest is the same. The interest actually will be going down on the amount because you have, you're working on a decreased amount owing. So you're gonna be able to pay off a lot faster, a $240,000 line of credit by our example, than you are a $240,000 traditional mortgage. So you might in reality, if we did this comparatively, if it's a 20 year mortgage, 240,000, and you have a 20 year home equity line of credit plan, then you will shave off five, six, seven years, potentially even more, depending on how much you put down on the principal, if you keep paying the same amount every year that you would on a traditional. So there's a lot of really cool things about it. And we're just touching on it. I would, I would um, recommend that if you have a financial advisor, ask them about it. And they will probably uh, be able, they don't do mortgages. Most of them that I know don't do mortgages, but they do know about them. And they usually know people who know something about mortgages so they could give you a referral. And I think that would be a great starting place for anybody that wants to look into the different kinds. And I think you have a responsibility, quite honestly, to look and see what the different kinds are, because then you want to see what works best for you and what works best for your family. So that is our mortgages for tonight. And some of the responsibilities and the rights that go with that. Now, you also need to know some financial rights and responsibilities when it comes to other creditor lending. And the big one here is usually credit cards. So they have a responsibility, a legal right, if you will, to the lender has a legal obligation to give you the person borrowing the money or the person applying for the credit card. They have to give you the terms of the agreement. So you have to get, and, and, and I know we've all seen it, and I bet most people haven't read it, that very, very, very tiny print that comes in that tiny booklet when you first get your credit card. Those are the, that's the term of your agreement relationship, because believe it or not, you're entering into a financial relationship with a, a credit card company. So when you do that, you have an opportunity to say, this is something I want, or this is something I don't want. So if you're applying for a credit card and their terms of um, uh, their financial terms for the agreement are an interest rate of 19.99%, which is very, very common. And if you're not willing to pay that, if you're late, or if you don't have the money to pay off your card that month, then you shouldn't get that card because that is the relationship that you are now establishing. And if you want to, there's many, many card companies out there and there's different cards within different companies. So just to make it more exciting, there's all kinds of different cards that you can get. So if you're looking at it from an interest rate point of view, which I highly recommend because the interest rate is the part that really, really hurts people. So we talk about compounding just as a side note, when we talk about compounding, we're talking about money, earning money, earning money, earning money. It is exactly the same when you owe it. So when I'm in my, when I put my financial advisor hat on and I'm talking to people about investments and how over time it should compound and grow, if I were to substitute the word investment with credit card debt, it's the exact same formula. And that's the scary part it is if you have credit card debt, it will grow the same way, actually faster because you have a fixed interest rate that's guaranteed. You don't have that in the investment world because it's, it's subject to whatever the market conditions are. So, you know, 
if your credit card is 19.99%, that's the guaranteed interest rate. So every single month that you don't make your payment, you're compounding your interest year over year over year because you know that's what your interest rate is. Your investments could be 5% this year, 6% next year. You might lose money if it was for temporarily, say from 2008 and 2009. You may have lost money for a period on time, of time on paper, and then they went way up. You might have made 20%. You might have made 4%. And over the 20 years, you might have averaged 9% or whatever the number is. With your credit card, if you did that same thing in 20 years, you average 19.99%. Because you're paying that every year. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's what they've decided. So these are all things that I just want to make sure people are aware of when they're looking at credit cards. Instead of being like, I need a card, I'm going to sign up. Look at the fine print and say, okay, what's the annual fee? What's the interest rate if I'm ever late? And is this the best card for me? Are there other potential benefits to it? Like, is it covering me if I'm traveling? Is there air miles or other kind of points associated with it where I get bonuses or I get discounts for buying gas or spending cash or spending uh, using the card at a certain place to buy stuff? There's all kinds of different things that we see now on credit cards. So they're not all, again, one size does not fit all when it comes to credit cards. So make sure you look for the card that best fits you. And if you're going for cards, and a lot of people don't realize this, they get caught up in this potentially, um, I don't know if it's excitement or what it is, but where they end up with all these different cards and they're paying annual fees on all these different cards. And next thing you know, they didn't realize they were paying several hundred dollars a year on cards they weren't using. So that also could be money that you don't need to be spending or cards that you could downgrade the amount or the, the bells and whistles that get added to it because you're not using them. Maybe you get zero annual fee, but you can keep the card in case of emergencies. If you were someplace and you needed to, you didn't have any cash or debit or card on you or whatever, and you need to use it. So there's always goods and bads with everything. Um, but that's a little bit about our cards and our mortgages. I'm going to take our last final break of the night and when we come back we'll wrap up our conversation tonight about financial literacy so don't go anywhere you are listening to kathy cook noble on the inspired choices network and this is our show financially speaking we'll be right back too many of us get caught up in the unreal lives of reality television and complete to acquire stuff which is setting us up to accumulate lots of debt we're scared, confused, and don't know who to talk to. By tuning into Financially Speaking Radio Show with financial advisor and educator Kathy Cook Noble, you'll learn tips you can use to improve your financial health, which in turn can improve your overall health and make for a very happy life. Live a life you can afford and enjoy. It is possible. Listen for Financially Speaking Radio Show every Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central. 2 p.m. Mountain and 1 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is the Financially Speaking Show with financial advisor and educator Kathy Cook Noble. To participate in the program, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email by sending to Kathy at BookkeepPlus.ca. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to the Inspired Choices Network, and this is our show, Financially Speaking. And today we are talking uh, more about our financial literacy, and we're getting a better handle, I hope, understanding mortgages and credit cards. So just to wrap it up and let you know, we talk about our rights and our responsibilities tonight. And here's the general, the general idea. Um, you have, when you go in to get a bank account, if you get a credit card, if you get a mortgage, uh, you have a right to receive statements about your transactions, your charges, your interest rates, how it's structured. You have a right on a credit card to know that. You have a right to receive that. You also have a right, um, if you are a joint card owner, to get a copy of the statement. And 
understand what the responsibilities are that you have signed up for as a joint. So if you get a card for your spouse, for example, that spouse has a right to know and has a right to get a copy of the statement. Um, you also have a right to refuse any overdraft fees and you have a right to uh, dispute um, charges that aren't legit, that you don't think are legit on your card. You have a right to dispute that. You also have a right to get um, consent for other people to get in information about your account. And you have the right to have your lender uh, do an investigation on your behalf if you have a dispute on your card. And you also have a right to talk to them about the interest rate. If you think that you were charged it wrongly, or if you think that there was a mistake there, then you have a right to talk to them about it. That's what you have a right to. Now, they also have a right. You're responsible to review your credit agreement. You are responsible to know whether you are reading it or not. You have a responsibility to know that small print. Uh, you're responsible for covering the monthly minimum that they assign to your card. So every month when it comes in and it says minimum payment, $10, $20, whatever it is, you have a responsibility to pay that. Uh, if you're a joint borrower, so you have a, su a supplemental card on that same account, then they always have the same responsibility for uh, the balance owing as the other person. So if I put you on my card, anybody on my uh, as a supplemental card, I have a responsibility to make sure that gets paid too. I'm re also responsible to let them know if I lose my card or if my card gets stolen or if I think I, I had an identity theft or fraud issue, I have a responsibility to tell them. It's not up to them to tell me. It's up to me to tell them if I think there's an issue. Now, having said that, sometimes depending on what kind of card you are and where you're with, they will call and say there looks like some suspicious activity on your account and they might either suspend the card until they talk to you or they might cancel it for you and issue a new one. And that's just, that's a good service. And that's good, good customer service for sure, because they're watching it for you because they might see something sooner than you do. If you don't get your statement until uh, the end of the month and this happened at the beginning of the month, then uh, you wouldn't know enough that that had happened yet. And then you can minimize uh, any exposure. So, or liability, which is also another reason why they do it because they're also limiting exposure and liability. So you have a right to these things and you also have a right to do some of these things. And I'm not gonna to talk tonight about bankruptcy, but uh, I do get that question uh, about bankruptcy. And, and I'm just gonna tell you that bankruptcy, you also have rights to know certain things. You have responsibilities to say and share certain things. Um, you have huge, there's huge, 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 huge conversations that need to be had before you sign those papers, because that is a commitment you're making. Uh, if you have a bankruptcy or you go through a bankruptcy, you are committing to being with that for the rest of your life. And I know people are going to tell you it falls off your credit report and it does, but you always have to answer that question on any credit. Have you ever had a bankruptcy and have you got a discharge and you might have to prove it. So 10 years from now, you might've thought, oh, I accidentally overspent or I was too financially irresponsible or I wasn't financially literate and understood what I was doing. And I'm just going to go bankrupt and make it all go away and start over. Um, you still have some responsibility to say yes on that box when it asks you, have you ever had a bankruptcy? And it might not seem like a lot, but it certainly, depending on what you're doing, it could be. And it also could affect a, a career choice. So the younger you are when you do it, the more you don't realize potentially how much it can affect the rest of your life. So those are, that's some area that I think you need to have more conversation even over before you do it. And there's a lot of times when it makes sense and there's a lot of times when it does not make sense. And talking to a financial advisor, I think, or an accountant is probably a better first step than going straight to a trustee because a trustee's job is to do that. And that's how they make money. And I'm, there's some good ones out there. Once again, it's like anything else. There's good ones and there's ones that could use some room for improvement. Uh, so that's another uh, topic for another day. But I wanted to just mention that because that does come down to our financial literacy and understanding it. 
Thank you for joining me once again, and we'll be back to wrap up our financial literacy conversation next week. And then have a more. Have a great week. Thank you for choosing to listen to Financially Speaking Radio Show. Kathy Cook Noble will return next Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Mountain, and 1 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. We hope you'll join us. Until then, have the best week of your life by making the choices that bring you all that you desire.